Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Daily Objective. And today is everybody's favorite day of the week, Philosophy Friday. We're diving deep and uh, we're going to be talking about Aristotle and Ayn Rand, the similarities, influences and differences. And we'll be taking your questions in the super chat. So get going with those. And also, memberships are now active on this channel. If you see a join button beneath this video, uh, hit join on YouTube and uh, see what cool features it unlocks. More on that another day. We got a lot to talk about. Please welcome uh, today's resident philosopher, Greg Salmieri. I don't hear you. Oh, hi. Nice to be here. All right. I have a hardware mute that I had on. Sorry. It's a, it's a rough day, but um, yeah. all right. So I've heard it said that like Ayn Rand is one of only four philosophers to present a full philosophy, like with all four or five branches. Is that is that true? Like the others being Plato, Aristotle and Kant. Is there any truth? Uh, to that? I, if you mean like they have um, things to say about each of those four branches, uh, five branches, no, then it's definitely not true. I mean, Hume, for one has things to say about all, all of the branches. And I'm sure there are a lot of people who we haven't even heard of, you know, who, who had something to say and no one thought it was that interesting and so it's not preserved. But I mean, I think a lot of people did. The, the, if you're gonna be at that level of abstraction, what you'd wanna say is like, who are the people who said significantly enough different things that they don't count as minor variants on one another? And then you can probably get it down to a smaller number um, I've heard people argue four, maybe five, um, but that's, you know, I don't know. I don't think those kinds of debates are that worth wading into until you're pretty far along in your study of figures uh, where you can say, well, what is really fundamentally different? I think pretty much before then you have to kind of hold them as authority statements from somebody. This person who seems to have said it a lot says it, but, um, and they're useful as, bits of advice in framing, who should I read to get the big perspective, perspectives, but I don't find them um, hills to fight or die on, so to speak. And it's not, whether you say there are six people or five people or who's in the top 10 uh, seems to me a more, um, a lesser issue. Okay. Um, now Ayn Rand calls herself an Aristotelian. Uh, is that true? I mean, am I correct to quote oh. her that saying that? I'm wondering if there's a passage she actually says, I'm an Aristotelian. She does say the only philosophical debt that I acknowledge is to Aristotle. And I think that's in a passage where she's taking debt really um, seriously. Like it's not, there's no one else she learned anything from or thinking about them, made her you know, see what was right or wrong about them. Elsewhere, she'll talk about ideas she got from Nietzsche and they're obviously ideas she got from Locke and the American founder. But debt in the sense of like this guy really a lot of the essence of it comes from him. I think she does think that. And in a, in context to where you're going to talk about, so Whitehead uh, at one point famously said, um, you know, uh, all of philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato. Then you get the perspective from Raphael and from others of philosophy as Plato versus Aristotle. I think in that very abstract perspective where you think not even maybe there were four, but there were two, there were just two basic ways, Plato versus Aristotle, uh, in that sense, Ayn Rand thinks of herself as an Aristotelian. And she thinks there's something right about that way of putting it very abstract. But as soon as you, but when you put it that abstract, you're abstracting away from a lot of features of Aristotle's actual thought. Things that when you're looking at it at the level of everyone's either an Aristotelian or a Platonist, you start to say, well, but Aristotle wasn't fully an Aristotelian. There's ways in which he was more like Plato than what the diametric opposite on the relevant scale would be. And so a true fully Aristotelian would, and once you start saying that, I think there's something right about that view actually. But once you're thinking of it that way, then you're using Aristotle as kind of an archetype for a approach to philosophy rather than actually how did his system work? And as soon as you get one, step less concrete, less abstract than that, I think um, you get the perspective that you get an Atlas Shrugged, where Galt says, calls Aristotle the man who, I think you might say whatever his errors, was the greatest of your philosophers. Um, your philosophers, the world's philosophers, in some sense, they're all of ours, but there's, you know, there's a break even with things that Aristotle have to be made, and there are significant errors. And the errors from Rand's perspective aren't trivial things, 
um, but they're all they're in a way trivial compared to the things that are right. But you know, if we're now a thousand years on, they're they they matter. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's always tempting to put things in a neat little box and just say, okay, Aristotle good, Plato bad, and then everyone goes in one category or another. But you know, and one, for- one has to, for some purposes, do that. I'm not saying one shouldn't simplify or one shouldn't get these these perspectives, but one has to see them as kind of very abstract perspectives that to see if they're true or not, you've got to kind of go down into the weeds of the thinkers a little bit. Then you'll see things that fit with some things that don't. And then you think about, well, when I sum all this up, is this basically right still? And I think it is basically right still in the end, but um, Mm -hmm. usually when one talks about a thinker as Aristotelian, they retain a lot more of the detail of Aristotle's system than Rand does. What she retains is, I think, certain broad orientations and identifications that distinguish him from Plato. A lot of uh, people uh, would associate Aristotle with Christianity. Is that is that true? And is is Ayn Rand the first or one of the like one of the only notable people to to like explicitly point out that in her, like Aristotle is actually antithetic to Christianity? Do you, do you see what I'm asking? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, so what happened is um, Greek philosophy in general was rejected by Christianizing Europe at the time of its Christianizing. And in particular, uh, well, but a strong platonic element remained in early Christianity through the works of Augustine in particular and others who were very influenced by Plato. And then you had a long period where a lot of these texts weren't even available, people didn't know how to read and so forth. Um, you have more of the Greek works being discovered, um, rediscovered to Europe, being read in now monasteries, which are the centers of learning um, in the, the kind of you know, Middle Ages as it's coming out of the Dark Ages. And in this context, you get a some people rejecting Aristotle contemptuously as anti-Christian, other people saying maybe we can do something with some of this. And you get this sort of grand synthesis of Aristotle and Christianity in Thomas Aquinas which um, is at the heart of um, scholasticism, of the beginning of the university system, you know, like uh, Oxford and the universities at Paris and so forth, like a kind of hybrid of Aristotle and Christianity is what's being studied there. And so there was a definite kind of fusion of them. And there are a lot of people who still are particularly Catholics, are Catholic thinkers, but not only have this kind of Christianized Aristotle as a big part of their, uh, of, of their thinking, but you've also had in the tradition people who have reacted against that, some of them rejecting Aristotle along with Christianity, uh, but others um, embracing Christianity and rejecting. I mean, like, so so Luther and Calvin don't, I think, have terribly high views of Aristotle and they're very pro-Christian, for example, right? So there were Christians who said, no, we don't want that Aristotle associated with us back before Aquinas and in the Reformation and other times. And, uh, and there are um, some people in the scientific revolution were saying things like, well, Aristotle, the way you read him is crap, but you know, the essence of Aristotle is like, think for yourself and so forth. And you can find some positive things about Aristotle in Galileo, um, in Darwin and, and in others uh, who might be seen as rejecting a lot of Aristotle. So there's always been people who've known that there was something amiss about this marriage of Aristotle and Christianity, but it's nevertheless has a lot of cultural, cultural cachet and import. So to Ayn Rand is the essence of Aristotle, the law of identity or, or AKA law of non-contradiction. And yeah, I think if you, if you had to pick one thing, the kind of chorus thing, um, it's that, um, the, you might say also the primacy of existence. Those are, are, are super, um, related to one another. I I'm remembering now I haven't, you know, we just decided yesterday we were doing this and I just got on the call from something else. I don't have any stuff prepared to say, but I'm recalling that I gave what I at the time thought was a really good statement of, um, of what to Rand was the essence of Aristotle and his influence in, uh, in the introduction to a companion to Ayn Rand. So I'm just trying to pulling up that, uh, that mm-hmm. passage now, and I'll read you just a few sentences that I think, um, uh, that I think is useful. Um, 
was he a primacy of existence like philosopher in Rand's view or was he like 90 10 like was he just like mostly primacy of existence with some with some uh primacy of consciousness like i think his- she would have seen his essence as the primacy of existence and then there are you know some mistakes that she'd call you know uh she might describe as prim- remnants of the primacy of consciousness or something mm-hmm. um are you still looking for the quote? Yeah, I've, I found it. So I'll just, okay. this is now quoting from myself. And then when I say quote within it, that's a quote from Rand. Uh, Though Aristotle's philosophy was in Rand's view, quote, far from perfect, unquote, she thought it contained the essentials of a rational metaphysics and epistemology. The world we perceive is real and populated by entities with determinate natures that we can come to understand by means of a rational process that begins with sense perception and culminates in a systematic knowledge in universal and essentialized terms. The Aristotelian um, emphasis on observation, logical rigor and causal explanation made possible the Renaissance in art and the scientific revolution, a growing respect for reason and an appreciation of life on earth led people to value the freedom that reason and the pursuit of happiness require in the seventh, um, and, and I go on about uh, this is the um, uh, cause of America and the, um, and the um, uh, capitalism. But it's those ideas, that kind of metaphysical and epistemological basis. And then when you move into his ethics, there are points of commonality as well. Um, but Ram was less interested in those. She saw the main, and there are also more points of difference there. But she saw the kind of key thing as this kind of, uh, metaphysical epistemological likeness, which you could put as the primacy of existence or as uh, A is A. And I think those are both fair. Aristotle doesn't literally say A is A, but uh, he says enough things that it's possible to, it's, I think, right to attribute that view to him. Um, but I think it, it's helpful to expand on it a little bit as I did there. So it's, there's one universe, there's not two universes and we're caught in between them. Um, we know about the universe by sense perception, but importantly, by reasoning based on sense perception, a kind of powerful, deep insight into causes and into the natures of things is possible to us. Uh, But it starts with sense perception and thinking the right way based on it. Um, I think those are the kind of the the essential features. So to Aristotle, it starts with sense perception. And and does he uh, see like a certain process of forming concepts that he... He, um, Yeah, I mean, what he thinks happens is through sense perception, we come to grasp, uh, we form something called experience. And exactly what experience is, is a little bit um, a matter of some scholarly dispute and a little under described, but you perceive something. If you were like a clam, for example, you would perceive say the taste of the water you're in. And then if it tasted bad, you'd like move your muscles and you'd get to another bit of water that tasted good. And you wouldn't remember ever having been in bad tasting water. So you just have kind of like what Ram would call sensations. Uh, Above that level, some animals have memories. They remember the particular things they've encountered in the past. Then above that for Aristotle is what he calls experience. And exactly how much falls under the realm of experience is a matter of debate, but it's, it's some kind of connected memory relating to types of things that enables you to make predictions, have expectations about what's going to happen. But importantly, you don't understand it in fully universal terms. And you don't understand why the things are as they are. You just, you know, you expect it seems like it's going to rain. You look at the sky and you say, it seems like it's going to rain. Or um, I feel like a cold's coming on. Like you remember having felt like this, a cold came on in the past. It's something like that that we have. And he thinks animals have some of that too. And then um, we can go from that to forming universal concepts um, and to understanding the world scientifically in terms of them by identifying deep causes. And he's much more articulate about what that developed scientific knowledge of the world uh, looks like once we get it than he is about the, the process by which we go from um, not yet having that to forming it and the different stages in the process, but he does have things to say about, about both. In uh, Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, uh, Rand goes through, I think, the four different um, like approaches to concept formation historically. Mm-hmm. And in, in one of them, she says, uh, one which was, she mentions one of the ones she considers wrong, and she says this was Aristotle's, and in parentheses, unfortunately, 
Uh, well, do you he recall? says, uh, unfortunately, whose ancestor is Aristotle. So the, the view is, is moderate realism about universals. I don't know how technically we want to begin saying just how each of these views works. Um, but that is, is a common view that um, about what concepts are in effect, that concepts are passive apprehensions of universal elements that exist alongside with particularizing elements in particular things. And she thinks that view is wrong. She attributes it, or she doesn't even really attribute it to Aristotle. She says its ancestor is Aristotle. People who call themselves Aristotelians today hold that view. And that, that last is definitely true. That was the view of the um, Levain school neo-Thomists and, and neo-scholastics who um, Rand had read a fair bit of, and they were, she often references them in her, uh, occasionally references them in, in laying out the problem of universals. And they thought of themselves as Aristotelian, and that was their position. Um, I've argued elsewhere in my, my dissertation work and that Aristotle didn't actually hold that view. Um, and I don't know whether Rand thought he did. She distanced herself from actually quite saying it. So uh, mm -hmm. that's interesting. Um, but I don't think that's his view. But um, in any case, he says less about the process of forming concepts and what kind of norms there are in it um, than, you know, those of us who are super interested in that issue might want someone to say. Um, and then I think is really needed to say to fully solve the problem of, of universals. Um, and I think that's, a, that's one, you know, uh, gap in Aristotle on, on these issues. Um, this is something, you know, in former phases of my research, I wrote a lot about. Hmm. Okay. Um, now, Aristotle, um, he was a biologist. He was, he was the son of a doctor, if I'm, if I'm correct. He was very interested in animals and life and dissection and understanding life. So that was kind of- Dissection even. What does that mean? You cut it up while it's still alive. Ooh, okay. Um, so he, he, uh, he was not approved maybe by, uh, by modern medical or modern scientific. Anyway, I'm, there's- uh, I mean, animals, animal, not yeah. people. Cuttlefish. Yeah, yeah. He was vivisecting in frogs and things. Okay, yeah. still, still uh, controversial. But, not for um, the squeamish. Yeah. Um, so that, well, that was so. That's uh, interesting. That someone who's uh, who was so interested in life would end up uh, making such groundbreaking um, like discoveries. I guess in philosophy or inventions, maybe is the word. In philosophy, um, Ayn Rand emphasizes values, and in her uh, in her objectivist ethics essay, she she says a lot about, um, I guess, like biology or life. She points out like that life forms need to pursue values. And that's a big deal. Is, is, is Ayn Rand the first to emphasize values the way she does? And does, does Aristotle make a, make a big deal about values? Um, well, a lot of this depends on, on how, what exactly we take values, we understand values to mean. So, Aristotle is very interested in the directedness of action and the directedness of action on good things and the things being good for the thing that's acting towards them, although he's not always that clear about that part of it. But um, everything aims at, at a good. Um, he thinks um, that is a kind of general principle in nature. Exactly how widely it extends is something that's, you know, uh, somewhat debated by Aristotle scholars when fire goes up, is it going up for the good or something like that? But certainly in living things, uh, everything living things do is for the sake of some good. And we have to understand living things by understanding what good they're seeking, what their good is, how the different parts of them and their different activities are seeking that good and so forth. Um, and it's, it's this, um, this fact about living things is always central to his thinking. So um, you can say that that's a focus on values, but, and you could even say it's it, in Aristotle and Plato, you see the beginning of this focus and in Aristotle, you see it really develop. On the other hand, it's, I think it's significant that, that it's a focus on the good, um, not on value. And the good is a kind of metaphysical term. It's like, it's out there. Um, value is more of a consciousness term, right? Um, someone values it. And so it's a value, it's the thing that they value. Just like concept is more of a consciousness term. I have a concept of this. Universal is either, which is the term that you get in Aristotle, is either the term for something that's out there in the world, or maybe it's the term for, that's neutral between whether it's in your mind and out there in the world. So if you think about the way Rand comes at values, 
she starts with the idea not of things being of value or being good. I mean, if you think of it in her personal history, but she starts with the idea of valuing things. Some people value stuff. They're all about something. They're passionate and other people are these like, you know, driftwood, loser resorts. They could take it or leave it. They don't care. Nothing really gets them excited. And so there's this perspective on being a value or caring, being energized. There's a kind of self-assertiveness and will and so forth involved in valuing. And um, and that's kind of where she starts in her discussions of this. Um, what do you care most about it? And that's the kind of view of value. And then she comes to, to think, to develop a theory of values in accordance with which values are objective and are um, indeed based on life and on the needs of living things and develop out of, of life. So that the values are part of living. For a human being, it's what we choose and direct our life towards. Before a plant, it's sunlight and water and so forth. And so there's a kind of, Aristotle doesn't talk that way uh, about values in that sense. Um, and if you wanna know like, what's the history of that kind of term? I mean, you find it in romantic writers. I think you find it a bit, you find it in Nietzsche and so forth. And Rand's ultimate view of this thing owes a lot more to Aristotle than it does to any of the particular people who might have used more valuing language. But there is an element that's in those people in that language that is not in Aristotle, which is the kind of emphasis on choice, the emphasis on um, passion, not as a, a source of everything uh, in Rand, but as kind of essential. And Aristotle's much, it's more dispassionate, it's more detached, it's more universalist. It's less personal. Um, one way of thinking of what Rand is, is if you think of either Aristotle or the Enlightenment, um, and I think the Enlightenment is, is in a way a rebirth of Aristotle, but a more individualistic version of it, um, plus Romanticism. And if you think of what the literary Romantics have that isn't in, um, that isn't in the Enlightenment tradition and isn't in Aristotle, that sort of self-assertiveness and personalness, I think is really essential to Rand and to what she, what's different from her, from herself. It's not the only thing, but it's a big part of it. Yeah, and now Rand said she could not have come up with her philosophy, but for the industrial revolution, because it showed her certain things about human nature um, and what it requires. Um, and I mean, as you're, as you're uh, talking about the romantic writers, I'm thinking maybe uh, if not for the industrial revolution, there wouldn't be romantic art. Like people wouldn't have time to produce and consume something so uh, personal and beautiful, just like most people didn't have time for romantic love. They were too busy with arranged marriages and, you know, working on the farm. Um, well, it's not, it's not only time, although that's a big part of it. It's the capitalism and the industrial revolution, which made, which, are co is co-evolved with it, um, made it such that choice plays a central role in our lives in a way that it didn't, didn't, it's not just that you didn't have the time to have the options, but like if your life was your father was a miller and so you're going to be a miller and milling's all you have to do and so forth. And everyone whose father was a miller was a miller or someone else was a plowman or whatever. And that's what you're going to do. I mean, you make choices on your own tiny scale, but it's, it's, you're not faced with like, what kind of life do I want to live? I can be anything, you know? And as soon as you have a, a, a much more sophisticated division of labor economy, you have uh, principles enshrining choice over these kinds of things. You have rapid change of what's happening to the career your father have not even exist in 10 years. You, know, you have to kind of think about and are able to think about what you're going to, to do with yourself. Um, I think it's, it's um, that makes possible a romantic movement um, in, in art, a kind of sense of the world as your oyster and open to you and open to radical change um, that um, was possible for very few people before that, if anyone. And it's, it's availability to a large number of people means now there's a, a lot of thinking about it, a lot of reflection on it, a lot of place for art that is developing and addressing that. And unfortunately, too often art that's um, um, boohooing the very things that have made it possible because they misidentify um, uh, facts about the world. There's a weird um, longing for the Middle Ages and so forth in a lot of romantic art. But nevertheless, uh, I think that's Rand's view that this all came out of um, uh, capitalism, that they're related. 
Yeah, I like how the oysters are are so useful today. First, they're helping us with sort of uh, concepts and or or sensation epistemology. Now they're helping us with the Romantic movement. Um, so what 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 did Aristotle say about art? I know there's a famous quote like like science tells us maybe what like what life is and or something, and but like art tells us what life could be. I mean, are you it's familiar history, with history? Actually, it's history, history versus right. okay. uh, versus mm -hmm. art. Yeah. Um, if anything, art's more like science for Aristotle, um, but it's not really art, so it's poetry. So for Aristotle, he, he doesn't have a concept like our concept of art, of the creative arts that would include, um, you know, music and painting and sculpture and, and literature. Uh, there's the, the concept techne, which is um, like a craft. You can make something and maybe what you make is a statue or maybe it's, uh, you know, uh, you're good at baking or whatever, you're a doctor, all those are, you make something, you make health, you make a bed, you make a statue. Um, one of the things that you can make is uh, is poetry. Poetry is just actually the Greek word for making something, You it, production, poiesis, and your, your poetry is your product. This is what you made. Uh, but it, it has a specific meaning of, you know, poetry, literature, basically, because, uh, so literature more widely than, than poetry. But um, and he sees, and then Plato also had seen, a connection between poetry and sculpture and painting, but there's not a kind of general word for it. And he has a, a treatise on poetry, the poetics, where he's um, talking about what for, makes for good poetry. And he, he makes some uh, uh, comparisons to what we would call the other arts there. And um, it's, Poetry is unlike history. Um, he's, he's, he's arguing against somebody who says like, the difference between a historian and a poet is in effect, the poet makes it rhyme and the historian puts it in, in, you know, in prose, not literally rhyme, but you know, puts it in, in, in meter and so forth. Um, like typically people who write histories write it in regular prose and people who write literature at this time write it in, in, uh, with poetic language, but that's not the important difference between these two things. You could, in principle, you know, switch the types of language for the types of enterprise. What the significant difference is, is that a poet, a historian is telling you about some particular event, what happened, how it worked. Um, what the poet is doing is something more universal. He's telling you about human nature and how human beings act and something that could happen anywhere at any time. Um, and that is caused to happen by something about human nature and the good and um, et cetera. That's what might be, that has a kind of logic to it. And he's bringing out the logic. So what he's doing is more like what a scientist would do, what a soci, you know, not a sociologist, but someone like explaining human nature and how human beings act would do. But he's not saying, you know, general human being type X, you know, the, the um, whatever, uh, the, uh, the, the, um, uh, intemperate man meets the, this kind of man meets that kind of man, and here's what happens. Rather, he makes it a particular person. He gives it a particular name and some particularizing characteristics, And but it's meant to show through the story of this particular person something universal, and two, something that, as it, um, it's sometimes paraphrased, might be and ought to be, something that has kind of a logic to why it happens, um, flowing out of the kind of uh, nature of the situation and of the characters involved. It's not just, uh, you know, some random happenstance or, or sequence of events. It's a kind of internal logic that brings out something about the causal structure of the world. And I think he thinks about the moral normative structure of the world. Thus, might be an ought to be as a gloss on it. All right, let's get to a few super chats. Um, Jonathan with 499 says, what is Rand's answer to Aristotle's concept of eudaimonia? Is it simply happiness? Um, so eudaimonia is a Greek word um, that's often translated happiness. Um, I think well-being is probably the best, if not translation, way to take it. It doesn't just mean how you feel, but you know how your life is actually going. Um, it's not Aristotle's concept of it. It's this is just a, a you know, uh, Aristotle says this is what everybody calls the ultimate end of life. But knowing that there's an ultimate end of life is important. Knowing that people call it eudaimonia or happiness or well-being doesn't help you all that much because as soon as then you ask, well, what is, you know, what is happiness? What is eudaimonia? People disagree as much as they did before. So it's like almost a placeholder term. Um, and then he has a view of what kind of life is a happy life. Um, what is the ultimate end of life? Um, and 
one way of putting it is that his view is life is an activity and eudaimonia consists in the living the human kind of life, performing the human life activity. And that that level of abstraction, I think Rand's view and Aristotle's are identical. The ultimate end is, is living for yourself a life of the human sort, the human kind of life. Um, for Rand, it's living your own life, but I think for Ar she stresses more the individuality of it, but I think at a certain abstract level, they have the same view. It's leading for yourself, the human kind of life. But then the question is, you know, why exactly? And what is that kind of life? And there, I think they differ. And I think the main difference uh, in them comes down to something, um, Rocky, you said earlier, um, the, the Rand thought that she couldn't have had this view before the Industrial Revolution. So for Aristotle, the key thing he wants to emphasize in the human kind of life is the activity of the mind. It's thoughtful, it's intelligent. You're going deep on things. You're, if you think about this um, distinction I drew earlier from mere experience, where like you've seen a bunch of stuff and you can form expectations and act accordingly versus you really understand it. Well, what makes it a human life is it's a life that's got a lot of that real understanding. And there are different domains of life in which that kind of human thing, that understanding is, is possible to you. And you want to be maximizing them. And there's a lot to say about that. Not, not only maximizing like how much time you spend, but like that's, that's the core of living. Wherever you can get that, that's the good stuff in life. And then he has views as to where, where that's available in life. Um, one place he does not think much of it is available is in making stuff, in earning a living. He thinks there's some in there. And like, you know, if you find a, a potter who really understands how to make pots, that's cool. That guy's thinking about the pots too. But I mean, wouldn't it be better if he didn't have to make pots and he could direct that intelligence to something better? I mean, that's like small potatoes depth in life. Mm -hmm. And so he doesn't see much of it in production. And worse than that, he thinks that um, anything to do with making the necessities of life, putting food on the table, so to speak, has a kind of servile element that draws you away from, from what's fully and truly human, this depth and rationality. And so we wanna have a life that kind of minimizes that. Mm -hmm. And so he doesn't see the nobility, the depth, the this intense humanness that he values in the activities that sustain life. Uh, so he wants you to kind of not have to do that much of that. And two, he doesn't see the ways in which the activities he values most, and the one he values most of all is scientific and philosophical understanding. He doesn't see how that has any role in, um, in putting food on the table and helping human beings to live as opposed to die, to survive, to carry on over time. And so um, he has this dichotomy between living and living well. Obviously to live well, you have to live, but you wanna live at all in order to live well. Mm -hmm. Living well consists in doing a bunch of stuff like contemplating, you know, philosophy and knowing about God and what makes the stars go around and all this kind of stuff. And you got to do whatever you got to do to keep alive, you know, and to make sure you're in a position to do it. But it's all for the sake of this contemplative activity and these other kind of activities that fall into this living well heading. And it's a drag that you have to do that other stuff too. And this deeper stuff doesn't contribute any to living well. Um, and so that's, I think, Aristotle's conception of eudaimonia, Aristotle's conception of the good life, not what the word eudaimonia means, but it's the kind of life that he thinks is eudaimon, is, fulfills this ideal of eudaimonia. For Rand, the kind of life that's best is very different. It's the life of a producer. Um, it's all the kinds of great depths of human thought, all the heights of intellectual achievement, all the using your mind does help put food on the table. Mm. And putting food on the table, making surviving is is essential to the human life activity it's not like the table stakes you know you've got to do it you got to put it, put down your you know uh way to survive in order to do something else rather if you're einstein or you're newton or you're discovering great things or you're ayn rand coming up with a new philosophy and writing novels and so forth all of that is how you're living including how you're making making your living and that integration i think is something that was um is essential to her i think that's a very much post a very capitalist post-industrial revolution kind of perspective. Um, not that most or all people after it had it, but it's um, one that's very much enabled by seeing that transition. And that's, um, that's what I think is the essential difference in her ethics in Aristotle. Yeah. And I'll add one other aspect to that. 
um, the actual content of Aristotle's ethics um, is kind of vague and hazy. And he says it's not scientific. You can only be so exact. Um, that's one thing kind of Rand criticizes him for. And I think part of why it's hazy in a way that I don't think Rand's is, um, is uh, I don't think he, he has this conception of the good human kind of life that involves a lot of thinking, but he doesn't know kind of what organizes it or puts it together. He, he's got a kind of disconnect between that and the actual business of living. And I think as a result of that, a lot of prejudices, confusion, things typical of his culture creep into his conception of what the good human life is. And worse than that, they creep in because that could happen for anybody. I don't think he has the tools in his theory of ethics to figure out what things belong in and what things don't. So I don't think in the end his standard is, is objective. It's kind of impressionistic and, um, you know, kind of life like mine with what I like about my life, but not able to say why certain things belong in and to earth or things don't. There's, there's a lot of shame uh, historically of, of producers, people who work for a living. Um, and it sounds like Aristotle is just one of many of people who think who would maybe prefer slaves take care of uh, practical subsistence. Uh, yeah, and he's not sense. just one of many. He's unfortunately, and I hear he's the same word, the ancestor of a lot of that. I mean, like he, he has a famous defense of slavery. And one that was appealed to by, you know, people who had slaves many, many generations. Had. So it's not just he happened to have this. I, he didn't start it, but, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, he has a role in that history. And it's definitely he, the ideal life is a life of a leisure gentleman uh, who has a household. And a lot of the work is done by slaves on, in it. Mm -hmm. And that's how it ought to be. And and overall, that that approach, uh, that sort of disdain for subsistence matters is like it, it, we, we might call that like a mind versus body dichotomy where like the mind is seen as pure and and uh, honorable, you know, to think and contemplate, whereas the stuff you need to do to fo put food on the table is sort of like it's a necessary evil or just a necessary um you know, it's, it's animalistic. It's seen as yeah. not so now Ayn Rand, she, uh, she, she brings glory to the businessman and to the producer or the entrepreneurs and the scientists whose work, uh, you know, uh, leads to, um, commercial success. Like, so to Ayn Rand, there is no dichotomy and she, she relates the intellect to production, uh, in a way that hasn't been. Yeah. Done. I think, um, all of that is right. I think it is a mind body dichotomy. I think, in a way, Stadler and Atlas Shrugged is very Aristotelian. The, um, the what can you do when you have to deal with it? The weird metal is an excellent piece of smelting and there's something admirable in it. But, you know, um, a lot of that attitude. And I talk about this in, uh, in an essay I wrote years ago. Um, there's a, a wonderful book by Robert Mayhew, Essays on Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. And I have two essays in it. And one is on the role of the mind in man's existence. That, that's what Rand described as the theme of Atlas Shrugged, the role of the mind in man's existence. And um, I bring out like, well, what does she think about the role of the mind in man's existence and how does the novel uh, illustrate this and what are the kind of foils? And I identify several different aspects of the, the mind in man's existence. And one of its roles is as the productive faculty. And here I think Aristotle is a foil. He does think the mind enables us to produce. So it's not like he doesn't, isn't aware of that and doesn't think it matters, but it's not what's essential to it. It's not, um, it's a kind of secondary kind of usage of reason, it's not the best usage. And as to the, and I think that is really a mind-body dichotomy. And you can see it in um, a few places in Aristotle's philosophy. So his conception of a God, of God, is of a mind that just thinks, and indeed just thinks about itself. It doesn't do anything. It certainly doesn't like try to help humans out, like, you know, maybe a Christian God, but that would be servile. Like he's, you know, God's like helping you in a sports game or something like, you know, or, or even helping you defeat injustice. Like that's beneath him. That, that's like doing stuff for people. That's not what God does. God just thinks that thinking is the best thing. And what does he think about? Well, the best thing to think about, which is himself. So he's just kind of there reflecting on himself. And that's all that God does. And through various means that causes other stuff to happen, but God's not trying to make it happen. He's just trying to trying to contemplate. And that's a kind of mind detached from the world. It's a, and that's the best thing. And it would be better for us if we could be like that. We can't be like that. We're in bodies and, and it's, not, it's not like we could do that, but we can't do it. But that's a kind of ideal to make our lives like in those areas where they could be like it. And the, 
in everything we do, we should try to have some, you know, uh, where it's possible, some element of this. And Aristotle thinks in production, you really can't, or can have very little of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a few more super chats. Do you have 10 more minutes? Uh, yeah. Okay. So Nathan asks, uh, do you think the lost works of Aristotle will ever be found? Which by the way, w- was it written by Aristotle or were his books written by his father and son to your knowledge? Well, none were written by his father. He, I, I don't think he, his father, oh. um, I don't know. Oh, you're, so you're thinking of the, the, the Nicomachean ethics mm-hmm. and Nicomachus is the name of his father and his son. It was okay. kind of traditional in Greek culture to name your son after your father, your first son. Uh-huh. Um, so thus, but um, yeah, the Nicomachean ethics are almost certainly named after Nicom- the son Nicomachus. Um, the reason for that, and why we can be really confident of that, is there's also a Eudemian ethics, and both his son Nicomachus and this guy Eudemus were students mm-hmm. of his, and so they had some hand in putting these together. But that is one's Nicomachus's version of Aristotle's ethics, and one's Eudemus's version of Aristotle's ethics. Um, but I don't think it's right to say they were written by the students. I mean. This is uh, everything's a little bit speculative. There are reasons to think certain things, but one has to go into them. But um, Aristotle had writings that were published during his lifetime. What it meant to publish things is like, you know, you could go, there were, there were scroll stores or bookstores or whatever, where people would have written things out and you could buy them and you can buy the latest copy of all of Plato's dialogues or whatever. And they were for sale and anyone could buy them. You didn't need that. And then there were like internal writings that you wrote and you'd share with your friends. And if you had a school, maybe they'd be in the library of your school, but they weren't available to the public. Through, through accidents of history, we lost all of Aristotle's external writings, um, which were dialogues. We have quotes, including some lengthy quotes from some of them preserved in other authors. There are fragments of them. If you get a complete works of Aristotle, you could page to the back and you'll see the fragments from various dialogues but we don't have any complete dialogues of his. Um, we do have many of the internal works, but not all of them. There are some that are missing. Um, and that we know he wrote because people made lists of here are all of Aristotle's works or whatever, various times. Um, but if something's published, right? Like it, it's clearly finished at a time and then you put it out the door and it's published and maybe it goes through a later edition, but like it's sort of unambiguous when it was done. If something's an internal work that you're sharing around with your friends and so forth, maybe you have students and every semester your students read your work as a kind of ongoing textbook, it's not clear that it ever gets done, right? Like maybe it's, you revise it every time you teach the class and uh, maybe it's always a work in progress. And maybe there are multiple versions of it. Like some years you do it this way and some years you do it that way, depending on who the audience is is and in in the, the, the versions overlap but they have a little bit different beginnings and ends there's all that kind of um i don't know um ambiguity in the workflow when you're dealing with non-published works so most of what we have of aristotle was his non-published works and at some point it was then put in chunked up into books and editions that could be published by various of his students and i think that what happened with things like the nicomachean ethics and the eudemian ethics is that's like you know Nicomachus's version of many of the, you know, he went into the ethics file and he took out the stuff and put it together into a book form. And maybe that corresponds to more or less how Aristotle taught that material part of the time. And Eudemus did the same thing. And then Eudemus did the same thing. Those two books overlap in part, but aren't identical. And I don't think it's, and we can't prove these things that the students wrote it, or even that it's it's that it's their notes from the lectures or something. Um, they're, they're too similar in style to one another for that. And, um, and we have examples of lecture notes that were published that were like student lecture notes from other people like Kant's lectures on logic or student notes. And like that was people who had paper and could write, like you were writing, scratching in pieces of wax with a twit. I mean, like, I just don't think you could have really taken it down and gotten things that were just consistent. I think it's much more likely they're different versions of Aristotle's published notes put out by people. Now, will we find... Um, lost works. I don't know. I mean, I'm not an expert in the discovery of, of text. The, things have been discovered that were lost. Um, the Athenian constitution was the most recent. There are new techniques of like, there are the, these papyri rolls at Herculaneum. Most of them are Epicurean um, texts, we think, but 
we don't know what all of them are. And there are interesting new techniques to try to read the writing off of these scrolls using like MRI machines or rather CAT scan machines and all kinds of things. So maybe we'll, you know, I, I don't know how to assess what's going to come out of that. Know, I'm hopeful, yeah. but we have quite a lot. Yeah. Let's, uh, I guess, let's work on uh, understanding what we've got. Um, now, I've got a question occurred to me, but I want to make sure I get to the super chats. Connor says, what books of Aristotle's were the most influential for Rand and what books would you recommend to read first to understand Aristotle? Okay. Um, I don't know which were the most influential for Rand. It's hard to know just what she read at what level of detail. She had the book, The Basic Works of Aristotle, edited by McKeon, which contains most of the works that, I mean, it contains the metaphysics and many of the uh, texts on logic and, um, and uh, the ethics and so forth, the Greek ethics and so forth. Um, and um, in, in the copy that exists, um, the Ayn Rand archives has, has a copy of, we can see certain passages she marked up, but not a ton of them. And she usually marked up things really heavily when she read them closely. So at least that copy of that book isn't one that she really dug deep in. Um, possibly she had an earlier copy of it. The ideas that are most important to her from Aristotle are expressed in parts of the metaphysics and in the organon. Um, I think most of her acquaintance with those ideas, most of her thinking of them and grappling with them is from secondary sources rather than her spending a lot of time with the primary texts. Um, so um, I don't know how much time she spent with the primary texts, but um, if you wanna look for like where he's talking about, you know, the principle of non-contradiction and so forth, that's metaphysics gamma, obviously Rand read metaphysics gamma because she quotes it in Atlas Shrugged, but, you know, um, and so I expect there's a copy that's a little more marked up uh, somewhere of it. And, but I think a lot of it is she read a Vindelbond's history of philosophy. She read a history of philosophy by B.A.J. Fuller. Um, she was in a lot of uh, conversation with Leonard Peikoff while he was doing his graduate work and with others who were students in philosophy about what they were finding. And I'm sure there was a lot of reading of, of passages in primary and secondary works connected to talking to them about those things. Um, for, and then she read and recommended a, a, um, a, a secondary source on Aristotle, John Herman Randall's book, Aristotle which um, that along with her review of it are good things to read. I don't think that's at this point in time, the best book on Aristotle, but it's pretty good. Um, as to what people new to him should read, if you're going to pick up a work of Aristotle's out of the blue and read it, um, I think the best one to read is the Nicomachean Ethics, not because it's the best, but I think it's the most accessible. And there's a lot of his ideas in it and it's interesting and, but it doesn't have, and it's not the main source for the deepest and most important ideas. Um, as to what else to read, there's a kind of um, difficulty in Aristotle's being very inaccessible. He's difficult to read. These are not works that were intended for a general readership, even a general readership in the time that he wrote, much less thousands of years later. He has a kind of confusing style or a style that makes sense once you're into it, but it's a heavy lift getting into it. Like he'll give references to examples that he'll expect you to know, but he won't explain them. He'll say, for example, um, such and such is like the snub. What the hell does that mean? Well, there's someplace else where he talks about the relationship between snubness and a snub nose. And then that becomes a metaphor for a lot of things. So it's just like you kind of have to have read a fair amount before you're in a position to, to really get the most out of what you're reading. And so you need some kind of secondary resource or scaffolding. And then when you look at secondary resources, they are either, the closer they are to the text, to the details of the text and how it's organized, the better they are at helping you get into the text, but the worse they are at um, showing you the grand sweep of why this matters. And the better they are at showing you the grand sweep of why this matters, the more extra work there is going from that to like, well, why does he say this in this sentence or whatever? So um, if you want kind of grand sweep of his influence, um, tertiary sources are often best, um, but uh, that is, you know, entries in encyclopedias and um, in big histories of philosophy. If you want things that help you access the corpus, um, but I think um, 
Ross's old book, Aristotle, is pretty good for that. Um, David Ross's book, he um, uh, translated a lot of Aristotle, and he has a book that's sort of boring. Uh, it, it doesn't have grand sweeping statements about his importance so much in it, but it's good at like, here's what goes on in this chapter, here's, this will help you understand that, it, and, and, and it's short. So I think that's a good way into Aristotle. Um, for things that give you some of the significance of him, it depends a little bit on what particular topics you're interested in, but I'll recommend a few things. Uh, on Aristotle's view of science uh, and biology in particular, uh, Alan Gotthelf has a collection of papers. It's one of these, Alan used to like these, these three or four titles in a uh, words conjoined in a title, which I always find confusing. It's like teleology, something else, something else, and uh, in Aristotle's biology. But if you just look up uh, God Health, Aristotle's Biology. It's a red book published by Oxford. Um, most of that book is, is too technical for general readers. Um, it's sort of very detailed, but there is a paper in it called Aristotle as Scientist, a, a proper verdict, which is a um, uh, derived from a speech he gave for a more general audience, which I think is a fantastic um, introduction to, to Aristotle on science. Um, the essay on Aristotle's biology in um, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Aristotle Online is, is uh, very good as an introduction to his biology. That's by, by Jim Lennox, who some of you may know, uh, was my doctoral advisor, incidentally, and, and Alan uh, was a collaborator of mine and advisor teacher. Um, there's a book called The Lagoon by Armand Leroy. Uh, I think the subtitle is How Aristotle Invented Science, which is a useful book. And maybe even better than the book is a BBC, um, I think it's BBC, it's British in any case, a documentary called Aristotle's Lagoon, which I think you can find online on YouTube, which is um, an hour and a half or whatever it is, uh, talking about Aristotle's biology, but using it as an introduction to other aspects of his philosophy. I think it's, it's really well done. I often assign it to students. Um, there's a book by Jonathan Barnes, an introductory book to Aristotle that has a lot good about it too. Barnes, um, I don't agree with all of his interpretations, but he... he uh, conveys a kind of majesty um, that um, that some of the other secondary sources on him don't, um, while being close to the text. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a hard some, stop. Sorry, any those are some books. yeah, I mean those are a lot of recommendations. We do have a hard stop. So uh, to people who uh, sent questions we didn't get to, and as well as a question, at least one question of mine, maybe we can do a part two next time you're available. And uh, I'm sure we won't run out of things to discuss then. Um, sure, happy to come back sometime and we can make it work out. Great. So, uh, so everyone, we didn't get to your questions are going to be saved for next time. And thank you for your super chat, Mary Lee. And thank you everyone who became members, hit that join button, become members, uh, upcoming shows today at 7 PM UK time. In just a few minutes, it's time it's finance Friday with Jim Brown. And he'll be talking about attack of the zombies. That sounds wonderful. Then at 8 p.m. UK time, it's James Valiant, Robert Naser, and Amy Naser discussing Leonard Peikoff's Forward Hall Forum lecture, Some Notes About Tomorrow. Um, that's coming up today. And then uh, this Monday, there's no Daily Objective episode, but we will be live streaming the London Free Market Roadshow in which Nikos and Razi will be speaking. So there's no Daily Objective, but in a way there is. Um, so, all right. Thank you, Greg. This was wonderful. Thank you. Hope to see you soon. Yep. Bye. All right. Bye, everybody.